I have a few thank yous um, for today. I just wanted to make um, during the symposium. Uh, thank you to my colleagues at the Codex Foundation, uh, Dina Pollock, Managing Director. She deserves a huge round of applause. <laughs> And Jonathan Gherkin, shop technician, designer, letterpress printer, and all around go-to guy. <laughs> uh, yes, there are only three of us. <laughs> um, so that leads me to the fact that we wouldn't be able to do any of this without our wonderful interns and volunteers. If you see them, please thank them. They're doing a great deal of work for us. <laughs> <clears throat> Many of whom should be here. The uh, volunteers who work more than six hours get free tickets to the symposium. Um, very importantly also, and I haven't seen if she's walked in yet, but I wanted to thank Amelia Grounds, uh, who has been kind enough to act as volunteer coordinator, but she has been doing much more and a solid support for us during the fair. So thank you, Amelia. And if you see Amelia, please thank her as well. She's been doing a lot of work. <clears throat> um, I would also like to acknowledge our board members, again, founders Peter Koch and Susan Filter, <clears throat> along with Duke Collier, Carolee Campbell, Harry Reese, Russell Moret, uh, Fernando Andarza, and our newest board member, Camden Richards. Thank you. Um, I'd like to, again, take a moment for a land acknowledgement, too. Uh, I would like to recognize that Berkeley sits on the territory of the Huchun, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chochenyo speaking Ohlone people. Um, this land was and continues to be of very great importance um, to the Muwekma Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona band. Um, as we continue on our theme of translation, uh, we continue today on uh, the second day of the symposium to think about our relationship as book artists to the various acts of translation we do in a myriad of ways within the work we make. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, Robert Bolick. <laughs> oh, <one more. laughs> At least a small intro. <laughs> uh, Robert Bolick collects, curates, and writes about book art, the book arts, and book history. His books on books collection can be found under the sign of Archimboldo at um, WW. I, I won't read the link, but if you, um, <laughs> if you just Google search uh, books on books and Robert Bolick, you'll find it. Has anyone been reading the newsletters? <clears throat> um, the newsletters are a wonderful contribution to the field as he posts throughout um, thoughtful writing and discourse about the work in his collection while comparing and contrasting with other works. And he also gives a bibliography at the end of um, each, which is a really great resource. So uh, Robert Bullock, please help me welcome him to the stage. Good morning. Uh, I can take this off and we can share the glare. Okay. <laughs> or I can keep it on. Uh, so thanks to uh, Inga uh, and to Codex for the invitation. Uh, it's an honor and a uh, surprise to be asked uh, for it. But I reckon I'm here as the representative embodiment of the truth that those who can do, those who can't collect and get to babble about it. Uh, more than talking about the Books on Books collection, I like showing it. Uh, recently, the Bodleian Libraries gave me the opportunity to exhibit the part of it that comes from the magic that happens when you artists bring the alphabets and the book together. As Mel Gooding uh, put it, there is indeed something magical about the look of the alphabet. It has to do with its infinite capacity to change shape and style, to express purpose and suggest mood, to be formal and informal, elegant and ugly, classical and romantic, delicate and robust. 
there is also something magical about the book. It too has the capacity to change shape and style and so forth. No surprise then that the magic doubles when an artist, author, designer, typesetter, or keyboardist, printer, or bookbinder fuses the elements of the alphabet or other writing systems to the elements of the book. I found in putting together uh, the Bodleian exhibition, there is far too much magic to squeeze into 16 display cases. Uh, some recurrent themes among alphabet artist books help to focus uh, the cabinets, A for animals, B for bodies, C for calligraphy. But the one I want to share with you today is B is for Babel. Despite today's multilingual packaging labels and those ingeniously, confusingly folded directions for our new appliances, or the occasionally mistaken choice of subtitling for the latest episode of an imported detective TV show, we Westerners tend to forget that ours is not the only alphabet. One of the works in the display case, Lizzie Brewer's Babel, reminds us that when we do remember, we likely associate the variety of alphabets with the biblical story of the Tower of Babel and the Almighty's curse of a sudden multitude of tongues <clears throat> to stop its being built. In Lizzie's version, letters and words in calligraphy from Farsi, Chinese, Kufic, Arabic, English, Greek, Japanese, etc., are laser cut from black Canford paper and arranged against a white accordion book stained black across its upper edge seeming to rain down from the black cloud of some single Ur language or from an angry deity, the words spill in a tangle across the white paper and into the foreground of the display. The Bodleian team decided on a red platform, presumably to hint at the too often bloody result of a babel of languages. But I wanted this display and exhibition to prod visitors to think about whether the variety of languages and alphabets might be as much a blessing as a curse. And that's why Sam Winston's book, One and Everything, is placed so close to Lizzie's Babel. Sam's book begins, once there were many stories for the world. Some had beautiful sunsets, others lived at the bottom of the sea, while others were simply full of dogs. <laughs> Each of these different round stories are filled with different alphabets, just as these Egyptian shaggy dog stories are filled with canine hieroglyphs. But as Sam tells it, there was one story that decided it was going to be, that perhaps it already was, the most important story in the world. So whenever this one story bumps into the others, it announces, actually, I am the one, the only story, and swallows them up. No surprise that this character is depicted as large and filled with letters from the Latin English alphabet. I won't spoil the ending for you. Please go buy the book. It is a classic. And check out the inspiration for the book Tim Brooks's endangeredalphabets.com. The theme of translation and the alphabet continues in the display case with Ellen Hex. A is for B. Most children's multilingual alphabet books restrict themselves to cognates like A for albatross, or T for tiger, pretty much the same whether it's English, Spanish, Portuguese, German, or French. Hex drawings use animals, their poses, and surroundings to draw attention to the letters of the one and only English alphabet, but the animal displayed never matches up to the first letter of its English name. Only the first letter of its names in other languages match up, and the online application that comes with the book provides pronunciation by native speakers. Another kind of translation that I was hoping the exhibition would prompt visitors to think about is the translation from children's books to artist's books. 
Golnar Adili's Baba Abdad, which appears directly under Ellen Heck's work, is clearly not a children's book, but its title is the traditional Persian sentence for first year readers and the small wooden blocks and felt binding recall the playthings of childhood. The phrase, which translates as father gave water, is associated with Sayyid Abbas Sayyahi, who wrote and taught the first grade book and was the co-founder of the nomadic schools of Iran. The education department in Iran uh, adopted his book nationally. And Golnar's work pays homage to Sayyahi and also makes us think about tactility and letters. Like the Arabic alphabet, the Persian or Farsi has remained script-based. To translate from the handwritten to the typeset has been a challenge. In books like Cultural Connectives, you find out how hard it is to design a font like Mirsal that works equally well for Arabic and English. The dust jacket here unfolds into a poster display of the book's epigraph from Gibran Khalil Gibran, set in Mirsal, of course. It says, we shall never understand one another until we reduce the language to seven words. I do wish we could have squeezed that poster into the case. So in the Babel display case, we also have a translation from 2D to 3D, which is what you get with Golnar Adili's book. And that is the third kind of translation that I hope visitors will take away from the exhibition. The translation from two-dimensional characters into three-dimensional artist books. In the display case, Claire Janine Satin's Alpha Book and Brynja Baldersdotter's Futhork also provide two good examples of the translation from 2D to 3D. Satin's alphabet books come in circular containers, constructed and bound in Italian Cyrillux cloth and topped with a water jet, water jet cut tile designed by the artist. Inside are four sets of pages, each set being shaped like a round edge triangle and post bound at the apex and forming a circle when fully opened. Three of the sets of pages consist of alphabetic notations, images, phrases, and poetry. The fourth set consists of accompanying text describing the alphabet particular to the volume that you've purchased. In this case, Cherokee. Brynja Baldur's daughter's Futhork, which is a work uh, created at Ron King's Circle Press Studio, combines the circular shape with the traditional codex inside. Its pages drive home the translation of letters into image and vice versa. And the argument about relationships of word versus image in art, the interior and exterior of this work come down on the side of word and image in art. Their complementarity and mutual rootedness and the reflective shield with which we translate the world around us. So many of the exhibition's other works could have been placed in the vitrine for B for Babel, but I hoped that the distribution across all the display cases of those works would create moments of connectivity, sending visitors back and forth uh, across the ages and from case to case. Uh, from the Bodleian's Kennecott Bible, which you see behind me, uh, which has the Hebrew alphabet uh, created by bodies and animals and the like, uh, to Rutherford with uh Trianus, or Trajanus, uh, which is a fabulous work uh, in homage to uh, the monument in Rome and also to Piranesi's etching. So these three kinds of translation, and B is for Babel, uh, translation from language to language, uh, from children's books to artist books, 
from the two-dimensional to three-dimensional complex objects occurred across the whole of the exhibition and also occur throughout the Books on Books collection. Whether the multitude of alphabets, writing systems, and languages is a blessing or a curse for humanity, it is definitely both of those for a collector of artist books. Uh, so many wonderful works, so little space, so little time, and so little money. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Robert. My first question is, is this a traveling exhibition? <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid not. It's all sitting now in the basement of the Bodleian. Uh, after the um, exhibition ended on the 21st, um, all of those books went downstairs, and they will now be accessioned into the Bodleian uh, as a donation. Wow, wonderful. <laughs> Uh, you, you can see the, uh, the exhibition online. Um, I put that up in association with Books on Books Collection. So if you look for Alphabets Alive, when you search there, you'll, you'll find it. Hi. Your first slide showed the first three letters from Leonard Baskin's Gehenna yes. Alphabet, uh, the long lost edition, which had been rediscovered only within the last decade. Um, and if anybody is interested in having a look, come to booth 41. We have a copy of it, and I can tell you the whole bibliographic mystery which was solved. This edition disappeared for nearly 30 years, is, was rediscovered, and is now once again available to the people that missed it th in 1970s. I can't tell you how privileged I feel living in East Hagborn, a small village about 20, 15 minutes, 20 minutes away from Oxford, because Oxford's Bodleian Libraries is the, holds the archive for the Baskin Gehenna Press. And we, I had all 26 of the original prints on display in the exhibition, and they are magnificent. Other questions? Okay, Russell, I'm gonna sneak up behind you. Uh, thanks, Robert. Uh, that's wonderful, and the ex exhibition was wonderful as well. The, uh, the, as a collector, I'm just curious to know, or, uh, do you collect only alphabetical works, or does your collection go beyond? Not that yeah, only no, we... alphabetical <laughs> works is a bad thing, but um, does your collection go beyond that, or is it specific to alphabetical works? Uh, no, it's alphabets turned into a, a sort of recurring theme, uh, but I also have, um, I don't know if you noticed, but with Rutherford's book on Trajanus, there's an overlap between architecture and artist books quite frequently. And so architecture shows up in the collection uh, over and over. Um, I guess the most famous of the archi um, architectural alphabets is uh, Stein jo uh, Johann David Steingruber's Architectural Alphabets, in which he did elevations of palaces that he hoped somebody would build. And they were all each in the shape of a, of a, a letter, A, B, C. He donated that to uh, the uh, Brandenburg family but the Brandenburg family that he donated it to must have been the cheap side, not the ones that sponsored and paid for uh, uh, box Brandenburg concertos. Uh, and it took him 10 years to put this folio together, and they didn't pay him a fennig. OK, I see Mary do my jog. Robert, thank you. Yes. Um, I wanted to know if you can tell us more about your books on books collection writing and how you go about writing. And it's a kind of an art form in itself, just your descriptions and such of the, the books that are in your collection right. or that you've seen. Well, <clears throat> thank you for that uh, compliment. Uh, I'm just conveying what the, the books do for me. Then that's, that's where the, any beauty uh, comes from. Uh, the, uh, the process used to be that I would be writing about the history of the book or um, book art that I saw. And then as I began to collect it, I felt that I had to express what I was experiencing when I was reading your works. And that's important to me that 
somebody, and I hope it's important to you, that somebody actually reads these things. They do require reading, even if they're physical, even if it's <laughs> visual, they require reading. You can't just collect this stuff up and stick it in a plastic box and put it in the sh on, in the behind closet doors, uh, which unfortunately too much of mine is, which is why I'm giving it to the Bodley and so that they will trot it out. It doesn't cost you much of anything to uh, get a reader's card at the Bodley. And yes, I do know it's a long way to go. But I'm hoping that with the books that they have and the artist books, that the artist books collections that they're building up, uh, that more and more people will come there. And if you have a reader's card, you can just simply go up into the Weston Library, ask them to trot out Rutherford's book or Claire Janine Satin's work, and you can touch it. You can feel it, and you, they will do not say, oh, that's enough time. You have to leave now. Uh, you can stay there all afternoon and, and all morning and handle these works of art, because that's what they are. So each time I get something, I try to get into it as far as I can, do some research, because I'm also thinking about once it's with the Bodleian, hopefully there will be students or artists or academics who come in, examine these works, and would like to connect them up with other pieces. And that's important to me because I like to compare and contrast, not to say this one's better or that one's worse or whatever, but it helps one book to explain another book when you do this. And um, that's what I try to do in uh, writing about these works that I've collected and still collect. Not that I have a lot of money, so don't everybody rush it. <laughs> Hello, thank you for your yes. talk. It's very interesting. I'm Sophie Schneiderman. I'm from London. Oh, <laughs> hi, Sophie. <laughs> hi. I think we understand each other. And um, I'm very interested in collecting and um, as a science. <laughs> and um, I'm, I'm very interested by the fact that you've given your books so young, relatively, for someone, um, to the Bodleian, and um, how much your detailed cataloguing of that enabled you to do that. Um, as a dealer, I'm also really a collector. I mean, all, most dealers are. And I have a sort of feeling that after I've cataloged something, I'm ready to let it go. And I wondered how much of that was involved in your, your deaccessioning, as it were. <laughs> Well, it's actually very, well, it's, I'm not actually letting them go. I only live 15, 20 minutes away. <laughs> and, uh, and they promised me that as soon as they are accessioned, I can re-accession them as I wish. Um, so that's, again, a very great privilege to be able to live somewhere as close to uh, the art as I, as I do. So it wasn't too hard a decision. And also, it, <clears throat> I had a, a partner sort of pushing. My wife says, we need the room. <laughs> okay. Is that? Are you doing this on purpose? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Kind of following on that question, and since we have curators in the room, um, I mean, obviously you chose the Bodley End because it's near you, but you also trusted them on some level to be able to keep the books in circulation and like you say, let people get in there and handle them. Is there anything that you think about when, I mean, when you made that decision in particular, did you have a relationship already with the curator? You know, what would you? Well, the, <clears throat> the keeper of rare books there is Chris Fletcher. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I don't remember the exact circumstances, but he invited me to a, uh, a terrible lunch at Exeter College. <laughs> But terrible lunches in colleges at university, Oxford University are synonymous. <laughs> and uh, we just sort of hit it off. And uh, he explained to me that he was trying to build up the artist books uh, side of things there. I mean, obviously, they've got ancient manuscripts and, and the like. Um, and th that impressed me. Obviously, the Bodleian has been around forever uh, uh, from an American's perspective. and. Um, so I thought it would be a good idea to um, make the offer uh, early on uh, in my career as a collector uh, so that we could all sometimes um, not collaborate but consult with one another. I try not to acquire something that they already have 
although they encourage me to do it anyway. Um, but um, I, if they've already got it, I try not to, to make that acquisition. Um, and that helps. I can't say enough about the Bodleian staff. Uh, Sarah Wheel, who is the director of Rare Books. Uh, Chris, the keeper of Rare Books. Um, uh, Maddie Slavin, who organizes the, uh, the exhibitions. Uh, a host of people there. They are um, very much, under Richard Ovenden, engaged in reaching out to a, the community, not just the academic community. One of the things that they did that I thought was so delightful with the exhibition was to put up a marquee just outside the exhibition hall and uh, deemed it the Todlian Library. And it was stacked with alphabet books for kids and blocks and, and so the parents were able to park the kids there, go inside, take a look at the exhibition, and then come back out. It's a very welcoming atmosphere now at the Weston Library. Um, I think it underwent some renovation about 10 years ago. So it's, if you find your way to England, uh, don't bother with the, the, the big smoke. Just come on out to Oxford down west. Um, it's much uh, more enjoyable. OK, any other questions? Yes, Audrey. Try not to wear you out with all these questions. <laughs> uh, we've been talking about the destiny of your collection. I'm curious about the genesis of your collection. I used to work at MIT Press. And when I was there, uh, there was a battle axe <clears throat> uh, in the design department named Muriel Cooper. And I don't know if many of you knew, remember Muriel. Uh, she designed the MIT Press logo. Uh, she was also an incredible design brain, an artist in her own right. I also was working alongside a, a chap named Roger Conover. And he was the editor for the arts and architecture list. I was the editor for the economics, the up and coming economics list. I got to deal with the Nobel Prize winners. But um, Roger's work at MIT Press, earned him, and this has got to be totally unique, earned him a gold medal from the Architects, Architectural Institute of America. And that would be like me getting the Nobel Prize for being the economics editor at MIT Press. <laughs> Not likely to happen. Um, but there was an awful lot of um, things swimming around me that I was totally unaware of. And uh, MIT Press sent me to Oxford uh, in 1980, 85. And uh, one of the authors that I worked there was, uh, with was a um, young lady named Ruth. And she invited me to dinner uh, with my wife uh, to talk about the neuropsychology text that we were working on. Uh, and it was the last dinner my wife ever attended with an author. <laughs> um, not because of the neuropsychology, but because of the great big bear of a guy who opened, flung open the door, had two huge hearing aids on the other side, and come in, come in, I'm sorry, I'm a little deaf. And uh, there was paper and prints and books falling out of the shelves. It was very Dickensian. And uh, we sat down, we had the meal, and I looked over in the corner, and it was a very wonderful print, uh, shaped like an hourglass with a, uh, the hinge element of it uh, that should be up and down, going sideways, two sparkly knobs on either side. And I said, that's, that's pretty interesting. That's, that's, how did you do that? coloring, the way it works, goes, gradates down and then gradates up. And he said, you like it? And I said, yeah, I like it very much. You want to buy it? <laughs> and I was fortunately sitting far enough away on the table that my wife couldn't kick me before I said, yes, yes. <laughs> and that's how I acquired my first print by Ken Campbell. Uh, okay. So that, um, again, I owe MIT Press a huge amount. Um, I didn't realize either for quite some time later that that print called In the Door Stands Ajar was also the title of a fantastic book which I was finally able to acquire. Uh, a gentleman could use a printing press like a paintbrush. Okay, I think okay. we're getting towards the end of questions. Maybe one final one if there is one. Okay, round Thank of you. applause. Thank, Thank you, you, Robert. <laughs>
It's really a pleasure to introduce Abra Ancliff, who I've known for many years. Um, Abra Ancliff engages printmaking and drawing to explore the fixity and frailty of language alongside how knowledge is written, printed, compiled, read, stored, ordered, dispersed, uh, and accessed. The history, process, and physicality of printing, publishing, and bookmaking becomes conflated with the acts of reading, writing, <clears throat> astronomy, geology, collecting, and archiving. In 2009, she started the Personal Libraries Library, a specially curated lending library in Portland, Oregon, that recreates and reconsiders the personal libraries of notable artists, scientists, writers, and thinkers. Oncliffe is the former BFA printmaking department head and associate professor of printmaking at the Pacific Northwest College of the Arts, and she is currently a visiting lecturer at Dartmouth College um, after her recent move to the East Coast. So please help me welcome Abra up to the stage. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Aubrey Ancliffe, and first of all, thank you to Inga and everyone here at the Codex Foundation. Um, I'm so appreciative to be here. And I'm going to start with something that may be obvious. I am nervous. <laughs> I'm nervous because giving lectures is nerve-wracking, and I am nervous to be talking about a body of work that I'm in the middle of. And it is something that feels entangled and a bit messy. So perhaps this talk will be a little entangled and a bit messy itself as a reflection of the work in progress. I think about translation a lot. I think about the translators and translations that have moved me the most and how they don't just transliterate a text as a word-for-word -word correlation but they also sweep up the dust and fallen scraps around the text, capturing something of the essence. Maybe it was the humidity in the air when it was written. Maybe it was the sounds drifting in from an open window, or a creeping ache in the poet's left wrist. Or as we learned yesterday, maybe it was the meadowlark's song. In that dust along the edges of the text, maybe the person who designed the first printed pages or set the type. Maybe it was the weary press that it was printed on or a new chemistry of ink. Somehow, the translator must capture a wisp of the ineffable, the ungraspable, the hidden layers and meaning of the book. And this is at the heart of what interests me in books and bookmaking. It is reading what is initially unseen and illegible on the printed page. It is reading not only the text of the book, but the object of the book, the porousness and permeability of the book, and of language, and of knowledge. I could begin to see multiple nested authors in one book, stacked and layered stories, and I seek to read what is normally hidden and slipping off the edges of the page. The page as mine shaft, as mirror, as lake, as sky, as garden plot, as meadow. To help root you a bit in my book and publication making practice, I want to briefly discuss a couple of my past projects. This is my American to Icelandic dictionary, Islandsk Abandarisk Orðabók. Perhaps a straightforward translation project where I made a translation dictionary using the words collected while watching TV in Iceland one dark December. Most of the television programming in Iceland at that time uh, consists of Icelandic subtitled American TV shows, specifically violent crime dramas such as Law and Order and CSI Miami. When watching television in Iceland, I also found my old friends at Beverly Hills 90210 and was introduced to the Real Housewives of Orange County. <laughs> Thus, I began learning Icelandic by watching American TV shows. 
This type of learning and translating also created an incomplete vernacular full of mistakes, misspellings, and unknowings. To represent the impossibility of actually knowing Icelandic, particularly through my own country's exported entertainment, I built in a physical gap that extends through the entire book. The gap, in its absence, becomes a solid presence of my unknowing, unknowing and subsequently those who read the dictionary. One of the final pages of the book contains a two-scale axonometric drawing of this gap as a visual rendering. It also points to the unseen letting and furniture, the architecture needed in typesetting and printing the edition. This is my publication, The Secret Astronomy of Tristram Shandy. I made this as part of a larger body of work named When Looking Down is Looking Up. In, the, in this constellation of work, I was exploring how we read the night sky on the printed page. The Secret Astronomy of Tristram Shandy reproduces over 100 of the self-reflexive black pages from multiple paperback editions and copies of Lawrence Stern's The Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy, Gentlemen. When taken out of context and accumulated as spreads, these once playful visual metaphors reveal the printing inconsistencies of ink on paper, such as varying density, hickeys, oxidation spots, fingerprints, offsetting type. The hidden nature of the page, that which was unread, can now be read. In this case, astronomical imagery is revealed, that of stars speckled across an inky blackness or the soft haze and ripple of a galaxy. Since the 1760s, printers and publishers have been forced to grapple with printing the black pages of Stern's novel. This is one French printer's solution. And in doing so, they created the night sky on the page, unfurling in the midst of Stern's novel. While I was preparing this lecture, I remembered an engrossing interview that I hadn't revisited in many years. It was with Randall McLeod, the incredible and unconventional textual scholar who focuses on early printed books and manuscripts. I dug out the interview and found this quote. That's the appeal of it for me, the unknown language hiding in the object, the book's song of itself and then to attempt a reading of the object as originally perceived in the light or darkness of the newly revealed text. So honestly, when I reread this, it made my heart flutter. The book's song of itself. Each book does have its own song, its own agency, its own path in the world. It is acknowledging not only the book as an object, but the book as a being, a life, a collaborator. The body of the edition fractures, circulates, and becomes dispersed like particles. The book and the edition are like light, both a particle and a wave. McLeod also gently leads me to the next step, the attempt at reading the object as originally perceived while layering in its song of itself. How do these readings affect one another, change one another, enlighten, deepen, resonate, correlate? And it is within this tangle that I find myself and my current project. While I was doing research on when looking down is looking up, I visited the Harry Ransom Center at the University of Texas in Austin, where I handled page through and studied many astronomy books that were in their collection. I was able to touch and read Galileo, all the Herschels, Apian, and of course, Kepler's Astronomy Nova, which was published in 1609. In Astronomy Nova, Kepler described two of his three famous laws, conclusively stating that the sun was the center of our solar system, and that Earth and the planets orbited the sun in ellipses. I wasn't far into the volume before this diagram revealed itself. I was taken aback and wondered, what are those flowers? What, 
what are they doing there? Why? So my first theory was that they acted similar to bearing type. They were present as surface area to bear the weight and disperse the pressure of the platen when printing. I considered that the wooden carved lines, arcs, and circles were so thin and delicate that they would crack without something to bear the weight over the successive printing of the edition. So rather than bearing type, they are bearing flowers. My printmaker's brain came up with a technical answer of bearing flowers. Because it enthralled me, but I couldn't spend time at it at that moment, I took photos of every diagram with at least one flower, uh, floating flower. There are 12 diagrams in all, um, and 37 flowers in total. And I continued researching my other project. <laughs> with some time and distance, the flowers kept nudging me. I started with research, wondering where they had been discussed before and what theories existed of their meanings. However, I found no mention of them anywhere. Nary an astronomer, designer, book historian, uh, textual archaeologist has discussed these flowers. Astronomy in Nova is a significant cornerstone scientific text, and it's still utilized and celebrated today. And yet, something else significant is happening with these flowers that nobody appears to be discussing. They have been ignored. Something so present, so seemingly inconsistent with the text in which they exist, something with so much personality and life, uh, they've been absented, overlooked, brushed aside. I have many theories on why this may be. The most likely is that they appear on first glance to be ornamental and not have any bearing on Kepler's text. I decided to take these flowers seriously, incredibly seriously. I also decided to take the woodcutter who carved them seriously. The woodcutter, who I call Dear Woodcutter. Because what Dear Woodcutter did was actually quite radical. They self-published their own book, a book of flowers, a florilegia, within the bounds of Kepler's Astronomy Nova. <laughs> Dear Cut Woodcutter hid a book within a book. I feel so lucky to be an artist where I can work within speculative modes, and this has allowed me to embody Dear Woodcutter and their love of flowers. Perhaps they were bored while cutting Kepler's diagrams and wanted to add something of interest. Perhaps their love of flowers was so intense and their desire of sharing their flowers so necessary that they knew they were engaged in this radical act of self-publishing. When examining the flowers, one sees that, although they are a bit crude, they are also specific. These are specific flowers that were carved by a specific person at a specific time and place. One can identify the flowers as individuals by the specificity seen in the leaves, petals, stamen, anthers, and calyx of each one. These were carved through knowledge and observation. Dear Woodcutter carved these wood blocks in Prague in 1607, two years before the Astronomia Nova was printed in 1609. The story of how Astronomy and Nova was published is fascinating, and much has been written about it. I wish I could go deeper into it now, but in short, Kepler did not have the blessing to publish this book from Emperor Rudolf II, or the son-in-law of Tycho Brahe, whose Rudolphine tables of data Kepler was using. It was controversial and heretical on many levels and necessitated a form of self-publishing itself. With a known time and place in mind, Prague, 1607, I found Oleg Polunin's A Field Guide to the Flowers of Europe. Using Polunin's book, I was able to identify each flower and ensure each was native or long naturalized to the region of Prague. Here are some of the images of deer woodcutter's flowers and those that I identified. I skipped. No, there I am. So this is the corn cockle with its elongated calyx. 
This is the Carthusian pink and its serrated petals. The willow gentian. The bladder cherry. And the purple crocus. I want to discuss the following four flowers because of where they grow, as noted in Oleg Palunin's field guide. This is the field bindweed, and it's found in fields, waste places, roadsides, and gardens. The field eringo in dry banks, waysides, and stony places. The long-headed poppy in fields and waste areas and the corn poppy, found in fields, cultivated ground, and waste places. I was struck by Palunin's terminology, specifically by waysides, waste places, and waste areas. These buffers, edges, transition spaces, these forgotten spaces, unseen but present, erased places, compromised spaces, maligned and unvalued places. Like dear woodcutter, wildflowers find the empty spaces, the cracks and crevices, the disturbed ground in which to seed and root themselves. These overlooked spaces are not waste places nor waysides, but undervalued sites of growth and restoration. The margins, the interstitial spaces, are first populated by primary succession plants, like these wildflowers and they begin to heal the exposed soil and create the conditions for the next layered life to come in. In this way, Deer Woodcutter seeded the disturbed ground of the woodblock and the empty soil of the page. Deer Woodcutter resides in the waysides, waste areas, and margins themselves as an anonymous early 17th century woodcutter. They are also forgotten, unseen, but present, and seemingly erased. If the wildflowers were being observed, they were likely being observed blooming when deer cutter carved them into the wood. I cross-referenced the bloom times of the flowers in each individual diagram and found that, indeed, they were concurrent bloomers. Not only do the flowers to point to a specific place, Prague, but to a specific season and series of months in 1607. For example, all the flowers in this diagram bloom in May. Thus, this flora may tell the story of a specific walk that Deer Woodcutter walked on a May morning, leaving the walled city, ambling on the road alongside where field bindweed crept, up to the meadows and the hills where peony and purple crocus bloomed, into the woods where snowdrop windflower was found on the sunny banks, and deeper into the shade to find the wood anemone. The flowers also necessitate a completely different path through the book. Where one isn't paging through sequentially, instead one jumps around from diagram and diagram to diagram in order to follow the blooming, blooming flowers through the months. It creates a, difficult, a different physical interaction, a new choreography now exists between book and reader. This is the first diagram encountered in the book, which blooms in June and July. The first blooms of the season of May are in the 10th of 12 diagrams, well into the volume. The structure of the book, the conventional reading, is obliterated, and a new meandering order takes place. Like a walk along the fields and into the woods, we must now traverse a new topography, and the book structure becomes fragmented or porous and full of wormholes. Unconventional or seemingly messy ways of reading are reinforced again by the fact that within the May blooming diagram that we just walked through, the first diagram carved, all of those flowers are upside down. Dear Woodcutter did not appear to know the orientation of the diagrams. Amazingly, the second diagram carved, or perhaps they were carved concurrently, of flowers blooming in May and June presents all of the flowers sideways. Up and down become confused, 
and now we must reorient the book or reorient our bodies or both. When traveling home to New Mexico a few years ago, I reached out to Bill Donahue, a historical astronomer who, I, who has translated the only English translation of Astronomia Nova. I had been using his translation to attempt to understand what Kepler was communicating, which I still didn't understand. <laughs> I met Bill at St. John's College, where he is a tutor emeritus. We sat at a little table by a window and I explained my project and research. He was so kind and open to my seriousness about the flowers. One of the most eye-opening parts of our conversation is when I asked him what he believes Kepler thought about the flowers. At the time, I was imagining that Kepler would see them as frivolous and distracting. Bill said that he believed that Kepler allowed the flowers to remain in the diagrams because he believed there was a correlation with his work. This conversation completely transformed my thoughts and assumptions. Of course, Kepler would not have published the Astronomia Nova with the flowers if he did not accept them. As aforementioned, I learned that the diagrams were carved in 1607, two years before the eventual printing in 1609. He had the blocks for two years. Indeed, he wanted to keep the flowers. Bill is precise about his language, and I thought a lot about the word correlation. I looked it up, and the etymology is from the 1560s, and it means mutual relation, interdependence, interconnection. Yes, dear Woodcutter's story and Johann Kepler's story are in correlation. They are in mutual relation and interconnected. Both are placing our Earth in the orbit of the sun. The flowers are proof of what Kepler is proving. The flowers and orbits are reflections of one another. The page is both the sky and the earth, touching, reflecting, touching, reflecting, touching. And so they are most certainly bearing flowers. Dear Woodcutter's flowers bear out the notion of Kepler's heliocentrism. They bear out the elliptical path. They bear out this beautiful correlation. And Kepler's Astronomia Nova bears flowers, it is full of flowers, flowers gathered up and presented page after page, leaf after leaf. Astronomia Nova is floriferous. Dear Woodcutter's flowers, and Kepler's orbits bear one another. And the book sings its song. Thank you. That was wonderful, Abra. Thanks. Is this? You? OK, there we go. <laughs> Um, we don't have a whole lot of time for questions. We do have a few minutes. We have one over here from David Abel. That was really uh, astonishing. Uh, and I just wanted to ask, um, Kepler, like Newton, was a mystic, uh, mm -hmm. in addition to being a natural scientist. And I'm wondering about the possibility that the flowers also have another dimension of correlation through the doctrine of signatures and herbalism and other mystical understandings of that? Uh, yeah, thank you, David. That's a great question. And it, it is something that I'm thinking about a lot, um, specifically because his, his mom was a healer. She was an herbalist. And she was actually tried for being a witch. And so I feel like that background is actually really relevant. Yeah. Any other questions? You've stunned everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you for pointing me. Do you mind? 
Thank you. It was really amazing. And I just wonder, what happened to the diagrams? You, you forgot them? You, you just let them go? Um, I, I don't understand. What do you mean? I mean, the, the diagrams, yeah. I mean, you, you focus on the flowers. Yeah. And the, but the diagrams, it was supposed to be like the main image. But yes. then they become the flowers of the flowers, because yes. it's like the no, ornamentation of the flowers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think in a way I have kind of just like flipped the hierarchy, exactly. <laughs> right? Like the idea being that a lot has been talked about those diagrams uh -huh. and um, not a lot has been talked about the flowers. So that's where I'm focusing. Mostly, no, yeah. Beautiful that you go that way. You know? yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? I'm just curious about how you were able to identify the provenance of the floral prints being Prague in 1607. Yeah, thank you. Um, so there are letters that Kepler had been writing to other astronomers at the time when he was working on Astronomia Nova. Um, so I have, I found those letters and he talks specifically about getting the woodblocks carved in 1607 in Prague. Yeah, so that was amazing to find out. Yeah. Any other questions? One over here. Uh, yes, Abra has a table. What's your table number? My table number is 77. One, that was beautiful. Um, but I'm, I'm curious about your creative process of um, invention. Like, is it, is your plan to continue to invent a story around this lack of information? I'm just curious about that perspective. Yeah, <laughs> good question. So um, eventually this will be a book and um, I've written quite a bit of, of poetry that goes in the book and I'm identifying the flowers, but uh, there's a series of essays that I'm working on that are dealing with all of all of the stuff that's around it, right? Like the idea of radical self-publishing, um, the notion of the book as ground and as sky. Um, there's, there's more, right, that's happening. But I do think that at the heart of it is this kind of um, speculation about the woodcutter, dear woodcutter. Um, and I've been writing dear woodcutter letters, which is how I started to call them dear woodcutter. Um, I felt like that was a way I could like, just figure things out. Like, let me just ask Dear Woodcutter some questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I'm Dominic. Um, Abra, that was the most extraordinary talk I've heard in decades. <laughs> um, I have a question. Sorry. <laughs> um, does your theory nevertheless bear out that the flowers still are supporting what could be fragile? lines, and do other printers um, agree? I don't know. I mean, I love it. I'm in a room full of printers right now. I, I think it could. I think it could, but I would, love, I would love to talk about it further with people. Yeah. Thank you, Abra. I think uh, we're good for questions, and please visit um, at her table to discuss more. We, so thank you, Abra. I am very um, thrilled to be announcing um, our keynote speaker, Camila Janan Rashid. Um, their bio is hard to keep up with <laughs> right now. Uh, I was excited to learn about her work more deeply after ordering her artist book, No New Theories, um, which came out in 2019 from Printed Matter. Uh, Camila Janan Rashid is from East Palo Alto, California, and now lives and works in Brooklyn, New York. A learner, she grapples with the poetics, pleasures, politics of black knowledge production, information technologies, unlearning, and belief 
formation. Most recently, uh, they are a recipient of a 2022 Sharing Stiftung Award for Artistic Research, a 2022 Creative Capital Award, a 2022 Betty Parsons Fellow, Artist to Artist Art Matters Award, a 2022 Artists Plus Machine Intelligence uh, Grants Experiments with Google, and a 2021 Guggenheim Fellowship in Fine Arts. You can learn more about the practice, um, about, excuse me, her practice in the Art 21 documentary, which was released in 2021, um, or a recent interview in Art in America, July 2021. I could go on uh, and on with awards, exhibitions, and accolades, but mostly um, I just want to read you the titles of two very recent exhibitions. I want, this is kind of related to something Forrest Gander said yesterday also in his talk. <laughs> um, I want to climb inside every word and lick the salty neck of each letter. This is an ex exhibition um, recently at Red Cat in Los Angeles. And another title, All Velvet Sentences as Manifesto, Like a Lesson Against Smooth Language, or an invitation to be feral, uh, an exhibition at Emerson Media Arts Gallery in Boston. In her recent exhibition at the Art Institute of Chicago titled Unsewn Time, Rashid uses printmaking, photography, painting, and video to explore alternative systems of reading, writing, and learning. She asks, how can we be anything but learners in a world that is slowly revealing itself to us? Uh, I'm just going to take one moment to switch this display, but please welcome Camila Janan Rashid. There you go. Okay. Boom, we're there. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I'm going to put on my timer uh, because I have the tendency uh, to talk for longer than the allotted time. Um, my name is Camila Janan Rashid. Um, I'm super excited to be here. I just want everyone to just take a moment to say hi to their neighbor. If you don't know them, even if you do know them, just say hi. <laughs> don't be shy. All righty. I'm sorry, I've made it seem like you're gonna have a longer conversation. Uh, that was deceptive, my apologies. <laughs> I have 50 minutes to say a million things, um, but I think I really wanna sort of start at a point of like autobiography. Um, so as the bio said, I grew up in East Palo Alto, California, which is about a 40, 50 minute um, car ride from here. And so for me, I give a lot of talks, but this one is particularly special um, because I often don't exhibit in California. Um, but are often not invited to speak in California. Um, I'm also not often invited to speak in California 40 minutes from places that were my sort of first publishing sites. Um, so I'm just very grateful uh, to be here. I'm not going to cry, but I am very grateful to be here um, now almost 30 years later of thinking about my publishing practice uh, to be here in this space. Um, I always do these like long notes on a form that are trying to explain like how I work um, and this time I've decided to sort of weave them in. But one thing I do want to start off with saying, and you're going to see a lot of Clarice Lispector and Gertrude Stein shows up and Emily Dickinson. If you don't like those people, you might want to leave now, but they're going to show up a lot. Um, but this first thing that I want to sort of bring in is this excerpt from Clarice Lispector's text, Agua Viva. Um, and she has this beautiful line that another person on Twitter who followed me brought me to. Um, and it reads, I want to write to you like someone learning. Um, and so I also want to add today that I would like to speak to you as someone learning. I'm not an expert in anything, not even in my own life. Uh, and so I'm just here to share a series of meanderings, wanderings, and thoughts um, around publishing translation in my writing practice. My note on form, Emily Dickinson has shown up. She's going to keep showing up. Um, uh, Emily Dickinson was writing these letters to Thomas Higginson uh, in the 1860s. He was the editor of The Atlantic, 
Uh, and part of it was like a mentorship. Um, some people have talked about this as a mentorship. Uh, I know some people have talked about this as like a trolling behavior that Emily Dickinson had. I like to go in that direction because it's a lot more entertaining to think about women who are intentionally inconvenient. Um, so in one of her letters, she writes, because if you know anything about Emily Dickinson, she was not one for form, she was not one for standard punctuation. So she writes this letter. She says, hey, dear friend, are these more orderly? I thank you for the truth. I had no monarch in my life and cannot rule myself. And when I try to organize, my little force explodes and leaves me bare and charred. I think you called me wayward. Will you help me improve? Now, I wasn't there. I can't pick up on all the notes and intonation, but I feel like she does not want to be helped. And I love that. She doesn't. And we all benefit from her refusal to, to, to be helped, right? And I'm paying a lot of attention to this language of waywardness, not because I think Sadia Hartman was thinking about Emily Dickinson, or Emily Dickinson was thinking about this future person, Sadia Hartman, but there is a similarity in the ways that we talk about waywardness as this attempt to get out of a form that is constricting. Um, and so as a note for form for this conversation, I had like 40 different ideas for what, what, I, what I wanted to talk about. I was like, okay, I'll do the talk that I did for um, the CABC keynote where I talked about quantum entanglement in books. And I was like, I already did that, so let's come up with something else. And so I'm very excited to sort of talk through uh, the evolution of my ideas around this work. The last uh, part of the letter that I want to uh, read is, uh, she writes, you think my gate spasmodic. I am in danger, sir. You think me uncontrolled, I have no tribunal. And this repetition of language around tribunals, around monarchs, around waywardness, um, all of these things are an indicator that she wants to escape a particular form, um, but also that any attempt to try to organize anything into a neat package is going to leave her bare and charred. So with that advice, I didn't try to organize this into like a neat package. I'm gonna let things sort of like leak out as they should and be organic and live. Another note on form, this comes from uh, my book, No New Theories, is towards the end of the text. Um, but it's just a note uh, that says, I can't be a comprehensive sentence. A sentence is structured thick. Likewise, I cannot be a comprehensive uh, presenter or sentence in this context, but I will offer what I can. Uh, who knows who this is? <laughs> Don't disappoint me, folks. X-Files, yes. We know the epic battle between these two. Um, and I think the lesson I always take from this show is sort of paying attention to our desire for like a perfect, clear, certain route and the importance of like respecting their journey. So there'll be some times where I'm just gonna say, just walk with me for a second. It's gonna take a moment to get there. Um, and so we're here. Uh, it is 1023. Uh, and I like to always say that what I'm saying now is what I'm saying now. You may see another presentation from me where I say other things because I've learned other things. Um, I also want to note that I do not enjoy talking about my work. I like talking around my work. And I used to think it was like a Trinity Minha sort of like speaking nearby. And then I was diagnosed with a learning disability. And then I learned that I just don't like getting to the point. I like to walk around. <laughs> I enjoy walking around, touching the edges, standing next to it. And so today is sort of uh, my attempt to like be more comfortable with talking about my work as work um, and not necessarily as uh, something that helps me think through other ideas. So you will let me know how we do. So the first place that I wanna start is sort of like identifying myself as a learner because it's pretty much the most important way that I sort of show up in the world. Um, and when I say learning, I'm not talking about the traditional like sitting somewhere and letting someone like give you information, but really surrendering and giving yourself over to a process where you are under, you're overwhelmed, undertaken through a series of experiences. Uh, and this is the picture of me uh, raising my hand in third grade, Miss Morselli's class at James B. Flood School. And um, I don't know what exactly this is an image of, but I am pretty sure I'm raising my hand to answer a question that no one asked. Uh, <laughs> Because I used to get bored quite frequently, and so I was like, I'll just make up my own curriculum, like, and I'll just respond to my own questions. But the most important thing that I'll note uh, is this about the author section. So my school had um, a publishing center, like a random publishing center. It was a trailer on the campus, and there was just this older woman whose name I do not remember, and I do not even remember her face. I think it's because I was short. I just remember her neck down. And you could go and pick paper. She would type out your story. You can make these books. And I actually have some of these books. So, uh, there are a series of them. Suna is a sci-fi story about planets who are battling one another until they learn to share, because I was learning about sharing. <laughs> this one here is Ankylosaurus. I spent a period of time obsessed with the Ankylosaurus, like obsessed to a parental concern. Um, <laughs> let's see, what else do we have here? 
We also have this kaleidoscope book, which I think that I just desired not to have a plot, so I just was like, kaleidoscope. <laughs> this one is one of my favorites. It's me sort of talking about my relationship with my mom. And this one is hilarious to me because I wrote it when I was six, and it reads, when I was a baby. I knew so much by six about <laughs> being a baby. And the about the author in these books, and I'm just gonna read this and we're gonna move on. Uh, the first one is, I'm six years old. My mom is a nice lady. I'm nice like my mom. I have six people in my house. I have more people. I have 15 people. My grandpa died. My name is Camila. It's all over the place. Syntax is terrible. My mom says there were not 15 people in our house. So <laughs> we don't know where that came from. But by the time I am seven, you guys, I am creating complex and compound sentences. My name is Camila Rashid. I'm seven years old and I go to flood school. Seven years old is very young, but I like to read, write, and do art. Um, I live in East Palo Alto. I'm in the second grade. I'm a good reader. And so now at 38, it's really exciting for me to both be here and to recognize that all the things that I said I enjoy doing at seven, I get to do professionally now. Yes, yeah, yeah, we should clap for that. And so um, anyone who knows me knows that I would never miss a chance to talk about my city of East Palo Alto. Um, who knows East Palo Alto? Does anyone, people have ideas, yes. So if you're from the Bay Area, you may have heard some things. Um, and I always like to use my time to, to you know, uh, expand the scope of what people know about the city. And so I wanna sort of give some autobiographical city history because I think in a lot of ways it grounds how I approach learning, grounded how I approach uh, publication, and grounded how I approach just life in general. Uh, this is a spread from Ebony Magazine in the 70s. Uh, the city of East Palo Alto created a K through 14 accredited school system. And it was the only black run school system um, at that time from the late 60s to the early 80s. Uh, and the reason why I mention this is because the uh, sort of philosophy and pedagogy of the school was really community oriented. There was a publishing wing. Uh, there are school and classes taking place all over the community, like in people's houses. This is Nairobi College, a new experiment in education for third world peoples. The community is its campus. Run by a committee composed of students, faculty, and community folks, the college has passed the first step of accreditation, but considers its role to develop leaders for non-white communities. It all ties in with this whole thing of the master plan. Uh, right. That, you know, like, like the thing of incorporation. Of the basic philosophy behind the college was this whole thing of community control and self-determination. It had to provide additional leaders for this community as well as other African American communities. The college had a dramatic impact on the community and it had a dramatic impact on the uh, African American community in the country. We were the only African-American community-controlled college in the entire country. For more than a decade, people in East Palo Alto maintained the only preschool through college, alternative black educational system in the country. It was a very exciting experience. I didn't ever worry about when kids uh, left here as to where they, where they could hold their own. We have to leave Gertrude Wilkes, um, but I like to remind people of the stock that I come from, and I think people often do this with sort of like family, like this is the stock, like the Rashid family. And yes, I am very proud to be a Rashid, uh, but I'm very, very proud to be from my city. Um, I think in a lot of ways, being from East Palo Alto and those experiences really allowed for me to develop a deep interest in like not only reading books, but like producing knowledge and being part of a publishing practice. Uh, most of the pictures that are taken of me as a young person are me in front of books. Another one. And another one. I really love Clifford. It was a thing. Uh, it was a thing. It was a, it was a moment in history. Uh, this is a poem that I published when I was in the fourth grade, um, The Waterfall That Flows, uh, and I, we don't need to read it, uh, but it's hilarious to me that I've been thinking about doing, that I've been doing this for a minute. Um, and so I just want to identify some different sites of publishing for me. Uh, I went to James B. Flood School. Um, this is the actual location of the school. I remember all of these trees. I remember not seeing the trees because I spent so much time indoors making books. So one big site of publishing for me is my middle and elementary school. Another side of publishing for me is Plugged In. It was a program that taught young kids how to code. And it was the first time that I actually started to think about websites as a form of publishing. So since I've been around 11, I've been coding and sort of playing with the idea of hypertext and building these browser-based environments and considered this very much a part of my publishing practice. 
And then my house. Um, I grew up in uh, on a garden on Garden Street in East Palo Alto. Uh, we lived across the street from a farm in a series of abandoned greenhouses and a tank house because East Palo Alto was uh, formally designed as an agricultural utopia. We also had a well in our house. Um, and yeah, that's interesting. Um, and so I just wanna sort of point out these different sites of publishing for me. Um, my parents can't be here today because they are not feeling well, uh, but I did just wanna point them out as a deep inspiration for the ways that I think about writing, how I think about publishing as well. In addition to my publishing practice, I also like to note that I have a practice around collecting printed matter. Uh, around 2019, I started to collect uh, a black printed matter with a focus on things that um, are oriented around the Bay Area. So you have Ache, which was a free publication for black lesbians that started in the Bay. You also have Fierce Love, Pomo, Homo, Pomo Afro Homos, which was an organization around black life. So I've been collecting things that are oriented around my neighborhood. And I also just collect things because they're aesthetic and, and sort of like textural qualities. I also collect letters. I have this thing where I walk around and take letters, pictures of letters across neighborhoods as a way to sort of think about archiving a neighborhood, not only through photographs or through placards, but also through the topography that exists um, in the neighborhoods. And thinking about signage is another form of publishing. And so we're gonna talk about my publishing history. Um, I've published now five artist books as an adult person, um, but I also wanna talk about publishing on the browser, as I've noted, publishing and architecture, so some of the installation work I've done, which I'll show, and then collecting. I wanna think about this as I publish on the page, I publish in the browser, and I publish directly on architecture. I wanna to point to my dear friend, Chang Yu Chin. Uh, her and I teach a translation class uh, in Montpellier, France um, for the past two summers now to dance students, uh, which doesn't make sense, but it makes sense. Um, and she has this beautiful line where she talks about publishing as a dandelion spreading its seeds. And I find that to be a deeply beautiful image to think about the generosity of putting something into the world. I also teach a class at this place called School for Poetic Computation, and one of my students, um, my Arabic, it's terrible. Uh, one of my students pointed out that the Arabic word for publisher roughly translates to someone who spreads. And so I went down a spiral around Arabic trilateral roots and just want to sort of keep reemphasizing publishing as this practice of gifting, of giving something over to the world. And so publishing is both an act of simultaneous dispersal and gathering. So what do I do? Um, I think the thing that I would like to say that I'm most interested in is the life cycles of text. Uh, and by life cycles, I'm intentionally using this ecological language to talk about texts and publications as living organisms that shift and change over time. And so my first engagement with life cycles includes this 1980s uh, excerpt from my dad's archive. When he was converting to Islam in the early 1980s, he would photocopy his notes on the back of his pharmacy school homework, and he would cut out pieces of the Quran and annotate and write on top of this, almost creating this palimpsest of his own learning process. Um, in 2019, and I'll, I'm going to talk about this book more, um, I published a book called No New Theories, uh, which had some errors. And I remember freaking out, which I'll explain that freak out shortly. Um, and we republished the book, but we sort of leaned into a public revision process where instead of pretending another book did not exist, we sort of referred to it repeatedly and also thought about uh, sort of live annotation or public revision. And then finally, uh, growing frustrated with the attempt to write on the substrate that is like a piece of paper or a browser or a word processor, I started writing directly on the wall uh, as a way to write in a way that allowed for a spatial relationship between ideas. Instead of scrolling through text, how could putting a word way over here uh, have a different type of connotation versus typing it into a word processor? And so when I was invited to give this talk, uh, I was like, translation, I had no things about translation, but I feel like everyone else is gonna do a very good job of talking about linguistic translation. And I kind of want to think about something else with regard to revision and regeneration and just the failure um, of these processes that we've all chosen to give our lives over to. And so one of the questions that animates a lot of the way that I make sense of the world and make sense of my own practice uh, has to do with this image here. This is an image that shows the progression of an archival object, right? It's created, someone makes it, uh, some institution captures it, it's stored, it's used, and at some point it may be deaccessioned or taken out of public view. I'm most interested in this question of keeping things in perpetuity. If we are to keep a text in a perpetual state of creation, never to be captured, then what happens? 
And in thinking about that, I always come back to ourselves being the sort of first context for that conversation around revision. And so oftentimes when I think about my own writing practice, I think about me calling on my former self and my present self calling on a future self as the writing practice. And so when I keep saying writing, what is writing? Um, I am not a person who likes to give firm definitions, but I'm working on it. Um, but what I will do is give some firm definitions, at least from my stance. Um, I have been writing for a long time, as we've noted. Um, and I think that there a couple years ago, I started reading more about Lucille Clifton, um, her spirit writing, and her sort of identification as a two-headed woman. And I was really interested in this idea of writing not as this mechanical cognitive task, but as a sacred behavior, as sort of a trickster archetype and a fugitive ritual. By all of that, I mean that when we write, we are trying to clarify, we're trying to reveal. And at the same time, the text is also working against us uh, to not disclose. Uh, the author is working against us to not disclose. So writing <laughs> is, 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 can be enjoyable and not enjoyable, but I'm really interested in sort of the process. And so when I talk about this language of trickster, this is from a projection that's up at the show uh, in Boston. Uh, this one line that I think is most interesting to me in terms of writing is, this page was intentionally left blank like improvisational hope. It contains possible worlds. That sentence over there is full of charm. She is a trickster. And so I like to think about my relationship to language of being uh, like a relationship any of us would have with another human, where I constantly have to like be closely listening to see where the wind is blowing. And I like this sort of relationship with writing as a, an actual relationship versus a thing that I have to do. And so in thinking about writing, I define writing as any mark making that's designed to communicate something regardless of its legibility. And when I talk about substrates, I'm literally thinking about the stage or context for something to happen. And when I talk about the writing tool, what I'm talking about is the things that make contact with the substrate for mark making. And that makes the writer, in this case, any entity across species, across a living death binary that are engaged with the writing tool in the substrate. And there's a part of me that thinks often about palimpsest just because of my interest in religious histories and religious texts, um, but it also brings me to Pope L, who um, in this 2017 publication writes to us, uh, skin sets in the past, for example, I always use a substrate or background surface when making skin sets. What if I did not? Written language requires a surface to be accessible, legible. What if the space of writing could be made up of many, many surfaces constantly in flux? What would writing look like in a space like this? And the activity of reading, how would it be accomplished? And so I'm deeply interested in sort of the instability of the writing practice and how we attempt to um, sort of translate that instability uh, into the published form uh, and interested in what comes even before the unstable text itself. What I'm curious about, writing. I, I, I've taken many, many years to write a specific artist statement and every single time I do this, I'm like, guys, I just like writing. That's, that's what I'm interested in. Um, and I think the reason why I'm most interested in this is because of its ability to reveal, or desire to reveal, clarify, and describe. And I think that whenever we think about things um, as substrates, I'm thinking about paper, skin, soil as substrates. When I say species, I'm thinking about things like snail slime and spider webs as a form of languaging. When I talk about states of living, I'm thinking a lot about Alexis Pauline Gums, who talks about ancestrally co-written text. And when I speak about states of consciousness, I'm thinking about my own practice around lucid dreams, my interest in automatic writing, and sort of this psychotherapy psycho, um, uh, engagement with edge sensing, or sensing uh, the, the conscious self and the unconscious self. And so I think about writing as a technology which is translating embodied and immaterial experiences into a written language. And any attempt to translate or carry something over introduces questions of loss, ruin, and failure. I want to bring in Clarice again because I think that she, in the most beautiful way, actually represents or says this thing. She says, what am I doing in writing to you? Trying to photograph perfume. And I thought about that, I was like, oh, you could photograph perfume, you could pull like a black curtain, and then you have to do, and I was like, listen to what you're doing right now. You cannot photograph mist. <laughs> you cannot photograph molecules that want to not be there, right? Um, and so I also, I'll come back to Clarice Spector a lot because I spent, it feels like two years trying to read Agua Viva and then being swallowed and pushed out, swallowed and pushed out. But I, I have two more pages to go. Um, and so one of the first places I want to think about in terms of writing is this language of writing as bait. 
Um, she writes, so writing is a method of using the word as bait, the word fishing for whatever is not word. And so I think in this like uh, description here, uh, it, it organizes us around a, a notion of loss, right? We write because we want to get back to a particular somatic experience. The word is fishing for that experience, but doesn't actually meet that experience. It's something between having experienced it and trying to approximate a, a description of it. I also want to look at the work of Maladoma Patrice Somme, uh, who was an African shaman who passed in a couple years ago. Uh, he talks about this, uh, the way that language tempts us. He says, because language tempts us with the possibility of returning home to meeting. Uh, and he goes on to say that language is not home. Uh, it is a thing that represents home, but it is not home. And so this reminder that uh, writing tempts us, but it is not the experience itself. Uh, Pope L also gets into this when he's asked about descriptions, uh, where he notes to us that writing as the ritual, not the gods. And he says, description always introduces a kind of loss in doing its work. This is no accident. It is a necessity. When creating a description, we must always reinscribe against that loss. The back and forth is unavoidable. And this line here, it's the deal we make with language. And I like to remind all of us here when we start complaining about writing, this is the deal we made. This is what we handed ourselves over to. Um, and he goes on to say, so is description separate from the thing it describes? Of course, that is its beauty. It's like the rituals are not the gods kind of thing, and that makes the ritual important. That it cannot be the gods, whether it's a conduit to the gods, that it's utility and it's futility. And I like his going back and forth between like, yes, also no, yes, also no, because I think that is most of our engagement with reading and writing is a moment of excitement and then sort of pulling back. Um, lastly, I just want to note something here before uh, looking at some uh, sort of ways I'm thinking about translation um, from uh, a Tijani Sufi um, who, uh, Amadou Habtaba, who talks about writing is one thing and knowledge is another. Writing is a photographing of knowledge, but it is not knowledge itself. And I think in sort of bringing in the same point over and over, I want to think about what we do in publishing and writing as an attempt to, to sort of draw out a somatic experience and put it on a substrate, but it still is not the experience. And that becomes an invitation to experience something with your own body, skin to skin contact. I don't want to talk about that. Uh, <laughs> I do this sometimes, but I'm not feeling it. Um, and so I do not believe in linearity, but for the, the affordances of Google Slides requires me to design things this way. So this is where we are. What I wanna say is, and thinking about translation and thinking about these processes of taking something from one experience and putting it into another form, I've been thinking about this language of carrying things. That the writer carries something, but not everything, from the source, the experience, to the target, the writing. What is carried over is limited by the affordances of the target. If the target doesn't have a word, a syntax uh, that's capacious enough, then a substitution and approximation is made. And so this is where we talk about loss and ruin. And that process of experiencing something in our body to when we get the moment to write it down or to relay it to someone, there's a bunch that is lost in sensory detail and the immediate feelings. And recognizing that as a writer creates a lot of relief. And so I sort of ask myself this question, if I experience writing as a slippery process of approximation, edging, and yearning, then how do I make sense of translation? And I think about writing and translation in the same way, God, Clarice is all up and through here, uh, through Clarice again, because she has this line at the beginning of Aqua Viva where she says, I'm trying to seize the fourth dimension of this instant now. I want to grab hold of the is of the thing. I feel like writing is attempting to grab hold and translation is attempting to grab a hold of the hold that someone previously attempted to grab onto. And so when I think about translation, um, I immediately went to math because I think that mathematical language uh, and sort of images show up a lot in my work, but I also think it's an interesting starting point. And the definitions that are provided from a mathematical context is a movement of a body from one point of space to another. So it is literally moving this, whatever this is, uh, from here to another. It's just domain transfer, right? And so that's the way mathematics thinks about it because these are stable shapes. I'm just moving this uh, object from one location to another, right? And I am not gonna say that translation is not mathematical. I'm gonna explain what math actually applies to them. Um, when a person is translating, they are carrying something, again, but not everything from the original text 
to the specific text that houses the translation, right? And I think this language of housing is important because houses have their affordances and certain behaviors are allowed in certain houses, right? And so when we think about translation, we're thinking about it again as this approach to carrying something, but also recognizing that in that attempt to carry something from one place to another, loss will happen, we will feel a sense of failure, and there may be some sense of the thing was ruined in the process of translation. And I always come back to Walter Benjamin, who uh, has this beautiful way of thinking about uh, translation in relation to math, uh, but in this case, to the tangent line. And so when I said before, translation is mathematical, but probably not the math that you want, uh, it's not a math of equivalency, it's actually a math of tangency. And so in this essay by Walter Benjamin, which is a translation, um, he writes, or as I think that he wrote in the original, uh, in the same way a translation touches the originally, oops, let me actually back up. What now remains for the significance of meaning and the relationship between translation and original can be easily summed up in a comparison. Just as a tangent touches a circle fleetingly and at only one point, and just as this contact, not the point, prescribes the law in a court, says a lot of words. Let's get to it. In the same way a translation touches the original fleetingly and only at that infinitely small point of meaning in order to follow its own path in accord with the laws of fidelity and the freedom of linguistic development. And so I kept thinking about the tangent line and I was like, you know, you love celestial mechanics. Is there any relationship? And I think there is. Um, escape velocity describes the speed and direction necessary for an object to escape the gravitational pull of another object, right? And so I kept thinking about is Translation almost like an effort towards escape velocity, where we touch the edge of a text, we touch the edge of a form, and then we find ways to sort of fly off with that inspiration. I kept thinking about this tangent line again, too, because the actual math of it is about, again, this slight touch before going on its own travels. And I just want to bring back Emily Dickinson again, because I think in a lot of ways she articulates something interesting about this flying off, right? This waywardness, uh, this attempt to not be bound by particular rules. And it's not that I disrespect translation. I'm thinking about the poetic translation, and I'm less interested in equivalency, but interested in sort of the poetics of what translation reveals about our attachment to certainty and our attachment to ideas of uh, sort of protocol, behavior, and non-waywardness. Um, and so I want to bring in uh, Susan Howe and Emily Dickinson. Susan Howe does a lot of work uh, talking about Emily Dickinson. Um, and she has this beautiful sentence. This is from Allison Parrish's um, lecture, Nothing Survives Transcription. Uh, and Allison writes here, in the face of all this, Susan Howe concludes that there is no editorial approach to Dickinson that could be truly faithful to her poetic innovations. And I keep thinking about this idea of something being unfaithful um, and what this sort of relationship to faithfulness and loyalty um, and monogamy even uh, sort of relay for our relationship to translation as a practice. Can a text have multiple simultaneous relationships to different translations? Uh, what does it mean to leave something without uh, sort of our touch of translation? Um, she goes on to say, words are only frames, no comfortable conclusions. Um, coming back to Celia Hartman, um, because I think in the same way that we talk about Emily Dickinson being against sort of this editing of her work, which becomes his own translation, um, Celia Hartman talks about waywardness within black studies uh, and within the history of African diasporic folks um, as something of, of a liberation. She writes, wayward. The unregulated movement of drifting and wandering, sojourns without a fixed de destination, ambulatory possibility, rush and flight, black locomotion, wayward, to wander, to be unmoored, adrift, rambling, roving, cruising, strolling, and seeking. And I want to hold on to this because I think that as much as uh, equivalency is a goal of translation, I'm also very interested in attempts at translation, which create new generations of work themselves, taking a line and letting that birth or create something new for us. And so this is a print that I made uh, in 2018 when I was particularly exhausted. <laughs> um, and it reads an exhausting dance, 10 dances. She's an anti-dance we need in the future. Uh, and I kept coming back to this language of anti-dance uh, to think about waywardness and this approach to going against the choreography of how something is supposed to happen, going against the expectations of protocol, and this desire for an anti-dance in many realms of our life, particularly in the way that we think about publishing and writing. 
Uh, this is me again. Um, as I had mentioned before, I'm a lucid dreamer, and a lot of times my lucid dreams, um, I am having these experiences where I'm like, oh, I just want to bring this back so I can tell someone about it. Um, and uh, in all my dreams, what often happens is I literally say, I'm going to take this back and show it to other people. And then I wake up and I realize something very important, which I think applies to translation, is not everything is meant to be carried across. And so when I think about translation as a practice, I think about this sort of notion of analogy being a sloppy menace. So this was a, a, a little wall carving. Uh, and then I made this larger where your analogy is a sloppy menace, a sloppy membrane, a sloppy mercy, a sloppy messiah, a sloppy metabolism, sloppy middleman, sloppy middlewife, sloppy ministry, sloppy misadventure, sloppy moat. Um, and I'm really interested again in sort of playing with language in this sort of um, alphabetical way, but to think about translation as a sloppy process, um, but it's not something that we need to be upset about, but we can actually think about sloppiness as an invitation for another form of creative practice. Um, I want to say something about this text, uh, The Ontology of the Accident, an essay on destructive plasticity. Um, I really enjoy reading the paratext for texts, particularly translations, because they actually often talk about their process for translation. And then I forget to read the whole book. I'm just really interested in their process. Um, but she writes, um, putting aside the equation of similarities and differences, the plastic equilibrium between a giving and a receiving of form, the accent that lies beyond difference. And I want to hold that there because I think a lot of times translation is like one thing moving over to another. This Thing moving over or something having to give over something. But I think this description of a translation practice reminds us that translation is bi-directional and is both a giving and receiving. It's simultaneous. Um, and coming back to Alison Parrish's uh, talk about transcription, she writes, when I say that nothing survives transcription, what I mean is that when transcription happens, the result is a crime scene, a murder which leaves behind a body. The word we use for a text data set after all is corpus, Latin for body, cognate with the English word corpse, but maybe that's too violent a metaphor. Instead, we might think of transcription as a kind of hospice, an institution whose role is to guide a stretch of language from this life to the next. And, I, and she is talking about transcription, and the lines are often blurred between transcription and, and translation in her writing, uh, or in her talk, but I really love this line, uh, a guide, a stretch of language from something that stretches language from this life to the next. And so I want to sort of imagine a translation um, to take from Alice in Paris as a kind of hospice where we're trying to almost house, nurture something from the life that it was previously in, in this language or this form, to the next life it could take on. And so what I want to say um, is that writing, we are assigning letters and punctuation to somatic experience, or trying to photograph the perfume. And then we do another layer of things. Then we try to translate the writing, which is taking the photograph of the perfume and sending it through another sieve of another language, form, or context. And so we get further and further away from the thing that actually happened by the time we move from writing to translation to translation. And so the thing that I keep thinking about uh, is writing and translation as something like traversing a body of water. Uh, and in that context, some things will not survive the journey to the shore of the new form. Um, and that which does not survive may not be intelligible or legible. And so the thing that I do want to say is like in using this language of traversing body, I kept thinking about floatsum and jetsum in this sort of relationship to debris or things that cannot be carried on. And then I sent a text to myself like at one o'clock last night uh, because I didn't want to lose it where I wrote translation as a faith-based faith -based practice. The faith that what needs to be carried over will be carried over. And dirty data, that which doesn't survive the journey moving from one domain to another or temporary permeability of the membrane to allow something to transform it. What happens when the membrane refuses to breach? Likewise, what happens when the body won't give itself over to a writing process? When none of Clarice Lispector's bait can entice you to produce language, we must start with the body. And so, yeah, we translate. It is mathematical, but it's not the math that you want of equivalency. It is more of a tangent. We're slightly touching, but it's never skin to skin contact. And so what I want to talk about as I wrap up, because I have to, I guess, talk about my own work, um, there are a couple of things around uh, ways that translation shows up in my practice. So I want to first sort of look at translation into architecture in the browser or translation from architecture in the browser. 
So again, this image is gonna keep showing up. Um, when I think about the installation artist, me, taking something that I've experienced, taking something that I've read, taking experience of moving through space and trying to compress that into a book form or into the browser. Something's gonna be lost in terms of spatiality, in terms of interaction. And so when I think about all of this, I want to point to a 2017 exhibition um, at ICA Philadelphia. It was a group show. And I was really excited about this show because uh, in all my neurotic energy, I pasted about 500 individual pieces of text across this wall. Um, and I was really interested in the sort of both dispersal and binding of text, right? So I had made books or I was making books, but I was also interested in what could a book look like when spatialized across space. So this approach of translating these Xerox copies that I had made or these books into a spatial environment, treating the folds in the wall as sort of the gutter of a book, treating the floor as a footer, treating the height of it as a title bar, actually pushing people from corner to corner in sort of this somatic exercise of reading with their entire bodies. And in this process of arranging them, um, the entire arrangement of this piece was completely improvisational, meaning that I sent a bunch of work to ICA Philadelphia, and I was like, I'm going to figure it out when I get there. Um, and part of this had to do with my desire not to overdetermine what I make by allowing for improvisation to enter the arrangement of language and text in a given space. What I learned from this process is that I'm really more interested in sort of spatialized reading and writing practices and sort of going from this to making books was a difficult transition because I was like, well, what, how do people like move around with the book? Like, do they, do they walk with the book and read and walk with, like I needed movement. There was something that would need it to be somatic. Um, and other work, this is from a show um, at the Kunstverein in Hanover in 2022. Um, they gave me all six rooms, and a lot of what we were really focused on, again, was sort of spatializing this language and creating an immersive text environment where people could imagine the dispersal of a text before it is then uh, sort of gathered again in book form. And we paid a lot of attention to the architecture in terms of sight lines. What does it mean to have a video that is showing through uh, the threshold of a door to be viewed at different angles and creating different sentences based on your physical location in the space? Also working with writing directly or painting directly on the wall, uh, this sentence has to be read as you walk alongside it. Uh, this is from a show um, at the KW Institute, it just closed. Um, it was part of the Sharing Shifting uh, Artist Award for research. Um, and likewise, we were dealing with the same questions of again taking this book and then compressing it into, uh, or expanding it into a different form. The process this time was a bit reversed in that we used the book that we made before the show as the score and we treated the installation as the performance. And so what that means is that we literally finished the book before we installed and then started taking cues from different versions of our past self to influence the way that we installed. So these are two pieces um, which include an original work and then on top of that, we place a piece of glass and then there are annotations on the acrylic and then we specially organize the lights that you would get a drop shadow and side shadows that almost conflate uh, both the original and the revision, but also create this sort of uh, palimpsest in terms of layers being built up on it. Um, also, depending on where you stand, you're getting a different sort of view of the annotations and the original text. Just more images. Uh, this is a poem that I wrote using um, a constrained writing technique that included me sitting with a stack of books and flipping through them, putting using my finger like a planchette for a Ouija board. Um, and I was so excited to write this poem because it was this long process. Um, and then I was like, how does this become a book? And I think that part of that question of like how to translate this into a book became maybe you don't translate. And I think that's part of what I want to say is that translation does become a choice and thinking about how moving something from one domain to another may corrupt the original intention or form of said work. I'm just gonna cycle through some images here. And we played a lot with this sort of uh, air shaft area specifically because we were interested in sort of readership from across the threshold, within the threshold, or intersecting thresholds. Uh, this is a work called um, Primitive Hi Hypertext after Octavia Estelle Butler, which changes each time um, it moves through a space. And each of the footnotes, um, five of them are actually located in the space, and then the other, five, the other seven um, are an invitation for viewers to actually create their own citation or footnote for that given piece of text. 
these are some more of these graphic based poems, um, which sort of work better in a book form, um, but also sort of open me up to a question around what would it look like uh, for this work to be expanded and not be constrained to a bound object. So this is the book in the coherence we weep um, that was published with KW. And the thing that I want to say, tell them I say hello. The thing that I want to say is that um, this book was exciting for me because it sort of pushed me out of my comfort zone in terms of process. Um, and the other thing that I want to note about this book is the cover is scratch off. Um, and we did this because we wanted each individual book to become its own art object through the interaction with the reader. So through flipping through the pages, scratching them, all these things, dropping in your bag, this book becomes an object that is of the person's interaction with the text. And so I think less so in terms of actual form, I was really interested in the possibilities of interaction with this text, how someone's interaction could create another layer or put on some more of the palimpsest. These are just some more images. And then I want to end on this note about translations between different versions of myself to talk about a book project that drove me crazy, uh, but is important to talk about. So the same image again, the reviser is, is carrying something, right? There's a previous iteration, there's the most recent iteration, we're carrying our old and new selves back and forth in this process. Um, and so I published this book, No New Theories, in 2018, actually. And then we found out it had some crazy errors in it. And I remember this. I flipped out. And I remember at the time I was married, and I told who was now my ex, I was like, oh my god, they published a book because I don't see what the big deal is, which is why we're not married anymore. <laughs> but like, do you not understand books? Like, This is a big deal. Um, but I mention this because I, at one point, thought I was freaking out about something crazy because I had spent all this time talking about contingency and revision and learning, and then when it happened to me, it was not sexy, it was not fun, it was not cool, and I hated every part of it. And so, <laughs> what I want to talk about is like books as the like I'm, I I have often had to say. Yes, I like the work that I make, but I'm deeply more interested in the process that it took to get there. And so the process that it took to get to this book was a deep learning practice for me. One of like, are your words just words? Or are they actually ingrained, internalized ethos and values, right? The second part was, for you, who have been talking about revision, are you willing to publicly revise and to publicly talk about this? So on the first run, we were like, well, <laughs> the, <laughs> they said, well, cut out the pages that are misedited. I was like, you're going to cut out the pages of a book? Don't think that's going to happen. And so I remember I went into a deep depression this summer of 2018. And then by the time uh, 2019 came around, I got an email that was like, hey, uh, there was, they accepted there was a printing issue. We're going to republish your book. So we went for the book. Um, and so we went through this entire process to make sure everything was fine. And there are still errors in this book. This is what I want to emphasize. No book is ever finished. No book is ever free of errors. But we went through this entire process to republish the book. And so this is the book. 2019, we don't have any more copies left. Very excited about that. Um, front and back. And I'm going to speed through this, not because I don't care about my work, but like the internet exists. Um, but the thing that I do want to say is like trying to treat publishing and writing as a drafting process or a sketching process versus creation of a final object. So this comes from Pope L again, where he says, I was thinking notationally with SS, not so with protos. By notational, I mean that each work was a notation towards some larger sketch, perhaps leading to some even larger mock-up. And so this book that was first published in 2018, then republished in 2019, will have another edition in 2025, and sort of making this like a four to five year ritual of returning to the same text and creating this bound palimpsest of different versions of myself across the same text. And I also just want to bring in Amelia Groom when she talks about Beverly Buchanan's work, The Marsh Ruins, and she writes, the marsh ruins are objects in process. As they crumble and recede into the ground, they enact unlikely modes of continuation in spite of and through their material dilapidation. And so I like to think about the books that I publish as both a translation of like somatic experiences into a particular form, but also as objects in process. And so a few more images inside the book. Um, I spend a lot of time working with the affordance of a Xerox machine. And so the aesthetic of the book um, is all Xerox because I literally made this with using Xeroxes. So we come back to this anti-dance again. What I want to point out is in thinking about publishing and revision and sort of translating different versions of yourself over time, uh, the person I did the interview with, Jessica Lynn, when I told her that we had to redo the book, 
she was like, yeah, we were not the same people in 2017. And so with that understanding, we were like, how do, what do we do? Do we just like pretend that interview didn't exist? And so we just started to lean into a way of sort of documenting a process through live revision and public revision. So what you have is the body of the uh, interview, uh, and then you have all of my annotations. Uh, Jessica also took a printed version of this and annotated it, um, which are all included as footnotes. And so there was this sort of epistolary process of going back and forth, any annotations of uh, thinking about within a given text, uh, is the marginalia the protagonist or is the core text the protagonist, but sort of playing with hierarchy in this way of drawing people's attention away from the typeset text also towards the handwritten um, bespoke in um, sort of like marginal text. Um, and I do love this book, but I think this section is the part that I'm most proud of because it was leaning into a process that we often hide. We keep publishing new editions of books and then we don't want to say maybe something was messed up or something wasn't uh, the way we wanted it. And I am enjoying the process of publicly translating myself uh, into different versions over time. I'm going to end with Gertrude Stein because why not? Uh, and uh, in her book, Tender Buttons, there's a newer edition from Broadview Press, uh, and it includes a bunch of like, um, like epitechs, like interviews, um, newspaper articles, clippings, uh, and one of the things uh, that comes up is she writes this book, Tender Buttons. Uh, this book is interesting as there is as much failure as success in it. When this was printed, I did not understand this creation. I can see now, but one cannot understand a thing until it's done. With a thing in the process of doing, you do not know what you are doing until it is done, finished, and thus you cannot explain it. Until then, you are just struggling. So this is just an invitation for us to all struggle through our <laughs> practices of writing and translation. Um, and not to feel the pressure of disclosing a perfect meaning while you're in the process of making the thing. I also just want to end on a note about citation, uh, not because I think that I'm just so amazing that it needs to be cited, but I do want to talk about citation in terms of like publishing um, and writing practices, not as something that is about uh, ownership, but as something that's about deep lineage storytelling or telling stories that center all knowledges that were possible and necessary in the production of a dynamic object. And so I look at Catherine McKittrick, I think about Charles Olson, I think a lot about Alexis Pauling Gums, and of course Ross Gay, and the way that they give themselves over to an acknowledgement of the ways in which the work came into the world. And that can include citing dreams, conversations with friends, a phone call, anything that was part of the process of developing the work. Uh, how to reach me? The internet. Uh, and then where to see my work, uh, there's a show that opens in Red Cat uh, that was already mentioned, uh, and then there's another show that opens in Philly and then in Berlin. Uh, the Philly show's title is The Soft Technologies of Your Poem Split My Body into 18 Secreting Stanzas That Bow Toward No Moons. That part got cut off. Um, I think that's it, folks. <laughs> Thank you, Camila. Um, every time I hear a talk by you, I'm very glad that when there's a video recording of it and I can watch <laughs> it again, <laughs> there's, it's so densely packed. Um, we have some people who will need to go to a bus, not right the second, but in the near future, so we don't have a whole lot of time for questions, and I really want to leave a moment for Betty Bright to give an announcement. Um, but if there's one person, uh, maybe two, who have a quick question, um, we'll do that. Thank you so much. Um, I am curious, there's so much, um, there's like a whole universe and archive of people that are, you're drawing on, including your past selves. Um, and I'm curious about how you record that and how you remember everything that you are going back to, if they're you know, through note taking or if it's just sort of as things come back up, they come back into the work naturally. That's an excellent question because I have 42 different methods of keeping track of things and I am keeping track of nothing. Um, so one thing that I will say is that in the last two years of spending 
more time like studying my own neurology because this learning disability diagnosis, what has become apparent to me is that I am resistant to um, sort of like centralization. I love dispersal. I love the idea of being able to spatially move through um, information. And so for me, uh, I've tried things like pocket. I've tried things like uh, printing everything. I've tried a bunch of different methods. But what I have come to recognize is that uh, Things come back when they need to come back. And I think that often has happened where I'm like, oh, dang, if I only say that link, and they always come back at the right timing. And so I like to sort of trust that timing versus trying to con to sort of create this almost artificial sex, uh, sort of artificial uh, process of um, collecting, because I think there's deep violence in the practice of collecting, of severing something from its context, of removing um, elements that are important for its sort of like lividity in the world. And so I think that for me, I kind of like let things simmer where they are. And then as I need to call them back in, I call them back in. And as I need to release them, I release them. And so it's less of a, I'm holding these texts, they're mine, and these are part of my archive, and more of like a gentle relationship with them where they come and go as they want, and I come and go as I want. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, please give Camila a big round of applause for being here with us today.